In this episode of the Payments Economy of Trust series, Ray Wisbowski, Chief Marketing Officer for Interest Data Card, discusses how to maintain and build trust with banking customers as digital takes over. He says bank branches can play a significant role even as more transactions move to mobile channels. Hi, Ray. Thanks for joining me today. I'm looking forward to our chat about the role of trust in the evolution of the bank branch. Thanks for again for joining me. Great to, great to join you, Karen. Okay, so so let's get into this conversation. I think it's an interesting one because of the evolution of, of technology and the relationship that consumers have now with the bank in general. It used to be that um, the association of trust was with the physical structure. People would see the bank on the corner. They would walk into the bank. they deal with the bank manager to have their financial services needs taken care of. But technology has changed that. Is the bank branch still essential in conveying that 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 opportunity for consumer trust, or is that changing? So I think it's evolving. I know I, it, it certainly isn't what it used to be where, you know, as you said, you see the bank on the corner and you know in the back of your mind that inside that bank there's a teller who used to be behind you know, bulletproof proof glass or bars and behind that was a safe and inside that was some money. <laughs> and we know that that's, you know, that's changed dramatically over the last uh, several years. Uh, and, and banking institutions as a whole have looked at the bank branches, you know, downsizing, making them more efficient, making them more engaging, uh, removing the bulletproof glass, really removing the money out of the, the, the bank in general. Um, and making that more of a point of, of contact and connection for when a, a person has a problem that they need to address. Um, and also the focus has been to combine that physical presence with a digital presence. So more and more banks are investing um, heavily, not just in, in a web presence, which has been uh, the norm for, for many years now, but more into a mobile experience. So being able to do more, uh, think about the, the branch in your pocket, if you will, mm -hmm. um, that your mobile phone now becomes that, that connectivity into the bank. But therein also lies a problem in the fact that you now are putting um, the trust that used to be controlled by a brick and mortar structure into environments where the bank doesn't have as much control. So in a mobile app, you know, suddenly I'm, I'm having to trust the person coming into the bank, um, whether it's through a mobile medium or web medium, uh, I have to trust that identity and trust you know, that I know who that person is. So the investment now is not in brick and mortar structures, um, but it's in the technology that ensures the identity of the, the consumer that's using that technology um, to bank with, with the institution. I, I I would also imagine that the investment is is associated in some part with being compliant and having regulations that provide another measure of trust for that consumer, given what those regulations require a bank to protect the consumer's um, money, frankly, and uh, and and access to it. Is that an important part of the trust equation, particularly with bank branches that could either be physical or digital? Absolutely. I think that what we've seen, and you know, going back to things like uh, FFIEC, you know, the first time that they tried to grapple with identity, um, they they came out with a, a very strong statement that, that they wanted two factors of authentication for a person to connect into their bank account. Um, but then that got diluted and weakened as it came out. And what ended, ended up happening was the picture. So, you know, when you logged into your account, it showed you a picture that you chose. And they considered that two-factor authentication, which most security professionals wouldn't uh, wouldn't agree with that, that sentiment. Um, and then over time, you, you have other things that have taken place, whether that was the, you know, some of the fraud or breach uh occurrences that have happened with some pretty significant institutions in the U.S. Um, and you have people like, you know, the, uh, the OCC stepping in and beginning to um, really have a, you know, 
leveraging a lot of audits, but those audits really focus on is that person who owns that account really that person? And so the fraud that we saw in the last couple of years had fictitious bank accounts being opened or account takeovers. So when we look at it and we go, well, people like the CFPB and the OCC, what are they looking at? They're looking at does a bank really know their consumer? And we have regulations in place to make sure that when you open an account that there's an identity vetting. So post that opening of the account, so getting through the anti-money laundering and know your customers, the AML KYC requirements, what's the next step? And so we look at this in our dialogue with our banking customers, really focus on how are you ensuring that that identity remains the consumer that you open the account with and that as they're interacting with you in whether it's a physical or digital way, that you provide them a way to identify themselves as strong and cannot be compromised. And so the regulation will never keep up with the fraud that's out there, but it's moving in the right direction. But again, I think that the regulation should focus on, it really needs to focus on the identity of the consumer. Do consumers make that connection? Do they just expect the banks to take care of this or are they aware of agencies and regulators that are actively engaging in trying to create a more trusted environment for the bank on behalf of the consumer? I don't think the average consumer really pays much attention to that. And well, let's put a caveat to that, the average American consumer because of the protections that are in place. If my account gets compromised, if there's fraud on my account, the bank then replaces those funds. I just have to sign an affidavit saying it wasn't me. And in most cases that happens in a really short amount of time, 24 hours. So the consumer doesn't feel the pain of any sort of identity breach. What I would say is that when you look at where banking technology is going, I believe that the banks are trying to be more, make it a frictionless experience for their consumers coming in, but to still continue to do that as a, to ensuring that there's a strong identity in place. So embedding more technology, more security control in the app, but doing it in a way that the consumer is not really involved with that process. For example, when you download the app to your bank, having the ability to bind the identity of that consumer with that device. So I know that that device, machine learning is what we call that, but it knows that my iPhone is bound to Ray Wisnowski and that when I log in using that iPhone, that there's a reasonable amount of understanding. There's also some intelligence that you have to build into the authentication engine in the back end, which is, is Ray in the US? Is Ray logging in at a time that he would normally log in? And some of the activity-based authenticators that would tell the bank that I am who I am and give them a reasonable amount of control to trust me and not force me to go in through several additional steps to log into my account. There are a number of things now that banks are taking on board from a technology standpoint to help make these processes more efficient and clearly for the protection of the bank and the consumer. You mentioned a few. Are there others that come to mind? When I think of things like the ATM, which has become very, it's a standard use of banking interaction is to go to the ATM machine. More are moving away from requiring a card, which is one way of identifying yourself with putting that technology into the mobile app through a one-time passcode. You go up, you push use my passcode, it generates it in the app. Again, that's a cryptographic function that's happening within the phone 
paired with an authentication platform that's in the bank. And then, you know, the second factor of that interaction is you put your PIN in. So you get the one-time passcode, which is unique, plus your PIN gives you access to your account. Other things like, you know, I mentioned the intelligence that's being built into authentication platforms. This whole idea of artificial intelligence and watching transactions really becomes the base foundation for how consumers are going to interact with their banks in the future. It starts, again, with that core identity, being able to have an identity that's associated with you with a device or with a certificate that would be issued digitally. And then pairing that with what the bank knows about you as a consumer. They would have certain behaviors, certain locations, certain times that you would typically interact with the financial institution. If you get outside of those thresholds or those norms, then it triggers the bank to say, you know what, Karen, I need a little bit more to make sure that this is you. You know, if you're at a trade show in Vegas and all of a sudden you're trying to withdraw $10,000, that's not your norm. I want to know that it's you that's actually trying to pull out that $10,000. And put it all on red. I didn't do that, though, Ray. I just want to be clear. You should go black. Well, you know, I may have pulled the $10,000 out to go shopping. However, gambling is not my thing. But getting back to the intersection of all the things that you talked about, you mentioned ATMs, which is, you know, really an access point that consumers have to the bank branch. How does all of this then wrap around the physical banking branch infrastructure and these digital touch points that consumers are using instead of or as a complement to them? Well, I think that one of the things that we have to remember is that the bank branch is still the preferred place where people go to resolve an issue. And what is that? What are those issues? So if I get online, I have a I need to make a transaction. Something doesn't go right. I want to go talk to somebody in person. So how can I make that in branch experience even better? And so leveraging the tools that we've talked about. So geolocation. When I walk into a bank branch, if I have an identity that's embedded into my mobile phone and I walk into the bank branch, it identifies me as the customer. And by the time I get to the teller, popping up my information so that I'm not having to go through a long process of identifying myself, but rather, you know, really just leveraging those digital tools for identification that then allows me to have the human interaction. So you see even, you know, even within the last couple of months, you see Chase talking about expanding their branch network. But again, I think that when you look at that, the trend has been for banks to reduce the number of branches. You're seeing a real turn into those branches becoming smaller footprint, but more interactive, more capable of doing things that are that facilitate that person to person connection and the technology then to support that. So, you know, like I said, geolocation for when you walk into the branch, one time password to interact with the ATM, potentially a Bluetooth interaction with a POS to identify yourself to the teller. Lots of different ways that you can use a mobile device with the bank branch to get that that smooth, frictionless experience for authenticating and identifying yourself to the bank branch, but then still having the presence of a human being to interact with. You know, we talk we talked about, you know, breaches of trust. And I think when it comes to your financial institution, that's a pretty that's a pretty big deal because of the nature of the relationship. So it's it's important to not not make that something that happens to 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 begin with. And I guess I'm just wondering, it's a two part question. You talked about the use of artificial intelligence and better authentication methods to assist there. Are there others that you are seeing become more popular and more effective? And then I guess the second question is, if if trust is breached, is it recoverable? 
The simple answer with the, uh, on the first is that we will always continue to evolve the technology to make that experience um, better for the consumer. You know, one of the things that we focus on, and, and we're, we're running a marketing campaign right now called Take the F Out. Um, it's a little tongue-in-cheek uh, about, you know, the frustration of, of having to authenticate yourself, username mm-hmm. and password, right. uh, uh, tokens, and, and so we look at this as, um, really taking that the, the, the factors, the friction, and the frustration out of that experience. So when it comes to a financial institution, evolving the ways that you embed security to where the consumer is not as engaged with the security process, but is secured in the process, mm-hmm. um, will, will continue to, to be really um, very important. Um, the, the issue of loss of trust, can you regain it? Uh, it, it really depends upon you know that the impact to the consumer. If if the loss of trust means that you know I I see in the headlines my bank has been breached, um, but I have no direct impact. It has no direct impact on me as a as a a account holder. Um, I think that the bank can work over time to repair that trust. Uh, but if it actually impacts me as a consumer and I lose money or even <laughs> For a short period of time, see uh, inappropriate activity on my account. It's a lot harder. Um, mm-hmm. There's a lot of competing uh, institutions out there that want, you know, that want my business. So is it easy for me to transition my accounts to somewhere else? No, that's one thing the bank has in their favor is that it's sticky. If you have bill pay and you know other other <clears throat> technologies that they provided for you. Um, it, it, it makes it a little bit more challenging to move, but if you know, given the severity of the breach and the impact on me as a consumer, would I make the move? Sure. There's plenty of, of financial institutions that that want to make sure that uh, that, that want my business and would uh, help me make that transition, um, especially if they're they're leveraging saying, look, we have a, a more trusted platform mm-hmm. and, and we've built in more security controls into our app or into our our web experience, um, and as a consumer, um, I, I would be inclined to, to hear those messages. I think those are powerful. So, I guess the f- final final question as we as we wrap, this has been a, a great conversation. So, so, let's say you're sitting across the table from the head of retail banking at you know giant big bank, and you're having this conversation about maintaining trust and thinking about trust as the bank branch itself evolves and takes on a different form and purpose. Um, what advice do you provide in, in terms of maintaining that trust um, so that the relationship is preserved as well as the integrity of the banking systems that support it? Well, I, would, I would first really focus on how do you provide a secure identity for your consumer? Um, you know, what is, what is the technology that you're using to ensure that that, that, that identity is uh, secure, um, that identity cannot be compromised? Um, in, in the case of, of you know, when you look at digital identities as a whole, um, things like public key infrastructure. So mm-hmm. issu- issuing a digital certificate that becomes that, that identity and then binding it with the devices that that consumer would use to access their accounts, whether that's a mobile phone or iPad or, or their, their home PC. Um, these become really important foundational elements to everything else. If you don't have a secure identity to start with, um, if the identity itself can be compromised, then there's where the, the number one problem would, would come about. Um, if you have a secure identity, then the fraud issues, uh, they don't necessarily go away, but they're, they're greatly reduced. The chances of, of your consumers being um, up to buy a breach event um, really are uh, much less than if you had um, if, if you didn't have a strong identity as a foundation. Ray, this has been a fascinating conversation. I really enjoyed it, and what I liked most about it was the ability to weave so many different aspects of the trust, um, the trust attribute, which is critical to 
the relationship between consumer and financial institution with important things like identity and how the bank branch can evolve to to keep pace with that. Thanks again for your time. Thank you, Karen. Always a pleasure. Thank you.